thing that was most striking to me is the apparent near unanimity that the sectarian divide system has got to go. You know, I'm, I'm curious. So you're back in the 1960s, the, the voices of, of positivity towards the, the power sharing model, were they mostly among Lebanese in Lebanon or was it mostly sort of a, a Western perspective? I would have to say that since virtually everybody that I was talking with was involved with Western European and American folks, mm-hmm. most of the people that I hung out with after all, So I would say it was, was, yes, there were Lebanese, but they were Lebanese who were, uh, you know, who had worked with and socialized with Americans and Europeans a lot, yes. Mm -hmm. And this actually... And you be full and people like that. And uh, Dan, I wanted to ask you about those memories going back now to the 60s and and perhaps even earlier. Um, I know that you grew up and you spent part of your childhood in Beirut. And if I'm not mistaken, it was in Ross Beirut, very close to AUB. Oh yes, very close to AUB. My my father and mother had had met in Beirut back in the 30s. Oh wow! Um, quite a while before I was born, um, uh, my father was uh, Islamic historian, studying uh, Arabic and Islamic history and learning the language better, and uh, uh, teaching at AUB. And my mother, a recent master's in English from Minnesota, <laughs> all by herself, wow. out to Beirut to be an English teacher at American Community School. she mm-hmm. That's the kind of adventurous person she was. That's where she met my father, and they had a, an amazing whirlwind romance in Beirut with a lot of friends, Lebanese and others. Then during the war, World War II, my father was brought into the OSS. He was one of the uh, Ivy Leaguers that was uh, cajoled into becoming the original OSS spies. And when the OSS was disbanded in 45 after the war, he stayed on in Beirut. We were in Beirut then. Mm -hmm. uh, In the CIG, which is the a central intelligence group, which was the um, birth of the CIA. They changed the name and changed its charter yeah. yes. a few years later. So mm-hmm. he was uh, one of the first uh, CIA members, although he he was killed in service before he was officially the CIA. Last spring, the CIA honored him with a star on their wall of honor headquarters in Langley as the first fallen agent of the CIA. Very moving ceremony. Hundreds and hundreds of people there who were the family members of others who have stars on the wall of honor. Unforgettable two days uh, in Langley. Dan, when, when you attended that event, did it bring back memories of Beirut to you? Oh, yes. The, um, they put on a special luncheon for our family in uh, a room with a, with a wonderful Lebanese catered lunch with all of our <laughs> favorites. The uh, uh, head of station from the Middle East happened to be there. So it was absolutely, we shared a lot of memories. So it's really a love story that turned into a, a professional career. And then ultimately, your father was assassinated on the job. What was he? Was he assassinated um, while traveling to and from Lebanon? He was on a mission in Ethiopia, actually flying from I think Jeddah uh, to uh, 
Addis Ababa yes. in a plane that crashed under mysterious circumstances. Mm-hmm. And my sister, Charlotte, who is uh, my younger sister, who was born in Beirut, oh, and okay. never got to know her father because she was just an infant when he was killed. Yes. She's just written a book about his life and about her efforts to find out the details of yes. his career and how and why the plane crashed. And it's, uh, it's a fascinating uh, mystery story, and it's all bound up with the great game of oil in the Middle East. It's also equally fascinating how different things were back then when it comes to geopolitics, and at the same time, things have been tense in the region going back now seven decades. Absolutely. She stresses in the book the continuity. The uh, scrambling over the oil began in earnest as World War II stopped. Right. And and so basically your your childhood memories, um, I, you were... In I guess four or five years old when you when you when you were I was five. Yes. Okay. Five. I was five when he died. Yes. Five uh, years uh, old. We were living in Beirut and we were living in in a, a wonderful uh, houses. Uh, we tried to locate this place in in Ras Beirut. Uh, it, it's the house is long gone and there's city buildings where it was. Yeah. But it was within walking distance of AUB and ACS. I think it was on the route list. Yes, and yes. It was a uh, house with a garden and a <laughs> uh, wall with a, with a high, um, well, a lowish wall and then a, uh, an iron uh, fence and gates for the driveway and a driveway and garage and palm trees and, and other trees. And, and uh, it was right there, right there in, the, in the heart of Ross Bay Route. The urban urban landscape has changed so much. I mean, I'm I'm guessing indeed. I'm guessing the entire neighborhood is completely different today. Are these memories of yourself as a child, or are they mostly photos that you that you have that sort of uh, helped uh, jog your memory? Because it's a very vivid description of a home from you know such a long time ago. I have some very vivid memories, particularly I used to love to hang out. Uh, at the fence, uh, up at the uh, up at the front gate, mm-hmm. uh, I could reach through and make deals with the local vendors. I'd have a few piastres, and I'd go down there, bargain with the That's with funny. the salesman for uh, the, uh, the two things I particularly remember are those wonderful zatar uh, purse type. I can't think what their name is in in, oh. in Arabic. The uh, the manu- so, yeah, yes, absolutely, yes. <laughs> and also, here's something which I think has disappeared. Uh, there were a little uh, sort of Turkish taffy, Turkish delight candies wrapped in wax paper for, you know, a penny or something. <laughs> and they had, they had printed on them a picture of King Farouk of Egypt. Oh, wow. <laughs> and I, I was quite fond of those. And so any spare change I had, I sort of run up to the street, see if I could buy a few King Farouk candies. That's funny. And, you, I mean, had you stayed longer, you probably would have become Lebanese. I mean, I don't know anything else. You're bargaining, you're finding the right food, full assimilation. Well, yes, I, um, I have only the memories of my mother and family, friends in Beirut, to attest to this. I don't remember it vividly myself, but I went to a, a nursery school, which was multilingual, and and my my Arabic and my French were were not bad. Yeah. <laughs> and it was five. I mean, they were five year old uh, Arabic and French. And then when we came back to the United States after my father was killed, uh, my mother was terrible with languages. Uh-huh. So it was okay. <laughs> it was okay to talk with in the house. My older sister was hard of hearing, mm-hmm. so she she hadn't picked up much Arabic. So uh, it, it it pretty well faded. Although I. Uh, I don't have any trouble hearing Arabic words, and it's pretty easy for me to pick them up. And uh, I still have my my stock of getting around in the street words, which I can drum up. Yeah. My mother, as I say, was not good at languages, but she had one. She had a few sentences that she that she used. And when we were visiting her and my younger sister in Beirut in in uh, 1964. 
Mm-hmm. Um, uh, we heard her use one of them several times. This is what she'd say to taxi drivers, and I'll say it the way she said it. Yeah. Shwai shwai, mavadi moot. I don't want to die. That's so funny. I did. <laughs> You know, it's it's good to know. It's good to know that the taxi drivers have always been reckless. It's not a new thing. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. Well, I remember. I remember vividly from my childhood, from from when I was five, watching two cars heading right towards each other on Bliss Street, both horns blaring mm. until they crash head into each other. <laughs> Right. <laughs> yeah, that's I, whether that's good or bad. It's still the same. <laughs> that, that hasn't changed. <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's always been shy about drivers in Beirut ever since. Oh, I, yeah, understandable. <laughs> Before we spoke today, um, we were emailing each other about uh, these sort of old memories of of Ross Beirut, and you you mentioned that uh, in in the nineteen sixties when you returned to visit your mom, that you you remembered the banyan trees of AUB. Oh. Absolutely. I had memories of them from, from when I was just a very little boy. And when we got back to Beirut in 64, now that's that's uh, 20 years later, as soon as I saw the banyan tree, my uh, head was just flooded with memories of the banyan trees. Yes, I had been delighted with them running around the roots and, and, and trunks and, and uh, scrambling around. I just loved those banyan trees. They're, they're very user-friendly for children. You can hide in oh, them. Yes. Yeah, it's almost <laughs> like a delight for kids to play in the banyan tree. It was like a merry-go-round for me. Yes, yes. Yeah, as soon as I saw it, I'd rush over to... Uh... But you were, you were visiting your mother later, so you were probably in your late teens by then? Uh, let's see, 21? 21, okay. 21, 22? So you were, I mean... You had not disconnected from from Beirut. I mean, you were returning to visit your mom. We moved back to the States in 47 after my father's death and and lived in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. And as I was growing up there, our house was uh, often uh, uh, hosted guests from Beirut. We had had pictures of Beirut and, and rugs and furniture from Beirut and guests, friends visiting when when people old friends of my parents came to uh, the states they'd often swing by our house in winchester massachusetts mm. so uh, i grew up with beirut images and stories and people uh, uh it was uninterrupted my mother made several trips back to uh, beirut in those years and then when I went off to graduate school with my new wife, Susan, in 1963 to Oxford, mm-hmm. she and my younger sister moved back to Beirut. Uh, I see. Uh, my sister went to a- ACS, graduated from ACS in high school. Right. And then went back uh, several years later after college to be a journalist there. But so my mm. mother and younger sister were living in Ross Beirut in a wonderful apartment building, which I think no longer exists, but it was new at the time. In mm-hmm. 64, when we visited, it was a gleaming new building called the New Mullis Building. <laughs> and among its delights was there was a pool on the roof and vivid memories of going up and swimming in the pool on the roof. Looking over the side, it was on the on the hillside and I could, we could look right down from the pool or from the balcony of the apartment and down below on the shore there was a circus that was uh, in more or less permanent residence. We could hear lions roar. <laughs> How many people uh, have the happy memory of the lions roaring outside their apartment in Beirut? Uh, we did. There was a, a wooden platform where uh, Lebanese folk dancers were practicing for, I think, the Baalbek Festival doing dances. So we had, it was it was quite a wonderful time in the 60s. So, of course, then Beirut was just the height of its glories. Yes. Uh, the Paris of the Middle East, it was glorious. You know, it's uh, these are 
two distinct eras, and they're not that far apart. The 1940s... No, only, yeah. yeah. 1940s and 1960s, yeah. But it all... I mean, it's it's interesting because it, from what you're describing, it, al- it almost feels like it's already become a different city. In the 1940s, you have sort of this remnants of the French mandate and these these vill- or these these homes on Bliss Street that, that are gone. And then 1960s, the, at the height of, of Beirut, that history is removed as well. So it's like two different eras that have been erased from Beirut's history. And, and little things, like it's not uh, Rue Hamra and Rue Bliss anymore, it's Hamra Street and Bliss Street. <laughs> That's true. The French influence was still quite strong. In, in 1964. It, it's quite telling that modernity hit the city hard. That two decades can fundamentally change, not just a neighborhood like Ras Beirut, but, or not for that matter, not just Beirut, but Lebanon itself. The, the same location, yep. you know, 20 years earlier, 20 years later, Beirut was changing quickly. You, you left in the 1960s, and if I'm not mistaken, you did not return until many years later. That you did not... Mm-hmm. It was, uh, I, I gave a talk at AUB when I was giving a talk in Istanbul at Boaz Street. And uh, I can't remember exactly, uh, maybe I wrote to the philosophy department that I, I'm going to be in Istanbul. <laughs> <laughs> Should I make a little side trip? I, or whether they knew about it and invited me. But my wife and I went back and it was so much fun to see Beirut again. And then they said, well, would you like to come and teach? Absolutely, yes. So in 2011, we went back. But can I ask you, Dan, in those 50, nearly 50 years that went by, when you right. when you returned, did you recognize anything? I mean, aside from the Banyan tree, aside from AUB campus, was the city even remotely familiar? No, it really wasn't. I mean, I remember, and it's funny, I was trying to think this morning what the, what the uh, uh, Lebanese name of this place is, but we call it Pigeon Rocks. Oh, uh, Roshi. Yes. Yes. <laughs> uh, uh, that, that hadn't changed. Much. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> love to go there. And, um, but aside from that, no, the souks were gone, which we'd had a wonderful time wandering through in the 60s. Uh, Hamra Street, I re- remember that, but it was very different. Hamra Street had been sort of like Fifth Avenue uh, in the 60s. Yeah. So it had been sort of downscaled quite a bit by the time we got back in 2011. Because it's, it's uh, I mean, you it's the Civil War, and then, of course, it's the post-war era. And these are two, I mean, yes. very, very difficult chapters in at least urban planning and urban... Uh, urban decay. So I, even myself, at times, I don't recognize parts of Beirut, and that's just from, you know, not that long ago, perhaps two decades ago. So it's a city that, that really looks fundamentally different each uh, at each different sort of distinct era. And I yeah. I met you at a cafe in Hamra, I, I believe. That's right, yes. Yeah, I, I believe it was Bread Republic, an outdoor... Uh, yes, it was, exactly. Our, our apartment was right in the same building. Yes. Public. We just had to walk downstairs and outside this wonderful place to have lunch. Right, and uh, I mean it's a it's it's a bit of a sweet story. I uh, a student of yours sort of knew that my my father was a fan. He had been reading and he had been speaking highly of of your work. And I mean. I don't think many people in Lebanese political circles were referencing your name for conflict. Or <laughs> he was a bit of a you know an outcast when it came to <laughs> talking about your work in government here. But but she student was she, she was uh, well aware at how uh, how much she enjoyed reading your work, and she told me that you were her professor, and I was stunned. I mean, other than AUB students and faculty. It wasn't really well known that you were lecturing at AUB. That and you were spending. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it was not a public thing. No, I just was a visiting faculty member. Right. So I, I mean, I kind of just uh, approached you, invited you to join the tour, and uh, yes. you were very generous. You, you kind of uh, let my father introduce himself, and we had lunch together. Oh, yes. And several times, it was wonderful. Yeah. Yes. And, you know, I I think these moments for my father were were the needed escape from his work. I was very impressed. 
he really knew he knew what he was talking about too. He he had very astute and imaginative questions and uh, sort of uh, challenges to me. It was delightful. Yeah, no, I um, I cherish these memories uh, quite a bit, and uh, I you know one of your uh, a book you co-wrote is in Inside Jokes. I believe it was an MIT publication. Yes. Uh, one of the last conversations I had with him was related to this work. I um, good jokes in that book. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and Dan, I, I wanted to maybe get your opinion today because we're, we're so far away from the early days of, of Lebanon. And you, you witnessed that yourself. I mean, your, your memories are of the first years of independent rule. We're seven decades away from that. And just yes. your, your opinion on the... Uh, 21st century and Lebanon and secularism in general. I know you've written extensively yeah. on, on, on secularism, but I want to, maybe your opinion would be, would be interesting here because you, you grew up in a country that is so not secular. Your fondest memories are of a place that is known for sectarian governance and a, there is a religiosity here that is, that is striking at times. Do you sense that now, not just Lebanon, but the region on the whole, is, is in a sense waking up to the benefits of secularism? I, I think so. Uh, my sense is that the best way to disrupt secular pathologies, uh, tribalistic uh, animosities and uh, fundamentalism, is to shine bright light on it and simply let young people observe and learn and see how other young people live and how they're taught, what they know. One of my fond dreams is to make sure that girls throughout the Middle East get proper educations. Mm -hmm. I'm not talking about brainwash, I'm just saying a proper education in the way the world is and foreign languages and mathematics and science and history uh, and at the same time learning about the other uh, religious groups that may be in their community or elsewhere I think that that perspective for one thing it disrupts the uh, closed channels of education that Otherwise, that you get in 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 your home from yeah. your parents, your elders, um, your elders simply can't go on instructing you the way they used to because you know all this other stuff. Yes. They have to adjust what they teach you to uh, accommodate to the fact that your head is now teeming with ideas that were simply kept out before. Mm -hmm. I think that this is the gentlest and most constructive way of waking people up from the sort of infantile dreams of, uh, of religious sectarianism. Your, your personal stake in this, does it go back to your earliest memories in Lebanon? Is there a bit of that in the story that you saw perhaps a, a country that was not really working, that was not standing on its own two feet properly? even with these voices of support for sectarianism here. I went to the uh, nursery school, the daycare at AUB, and uh, I used to amuse my father's friends. Uh, our house, this diplomatic residence, and so we had lots of uh, visitors all the time. Uh, they would say, oh, little Danny, um, <laughs> Tell me, do you go to school? And I say, oh yes, I go to AUB. <laughs> <laughs> because I was going to the AUB um, uh, daycare, which yes. was multilingual, multi-sectarian, mm -hmm. and you know, it was. I can remember vividly seeing uh, some of the kids, you know, my age, and, uh, little kids, and they brought their own special food, and they sat in a little circle and as I recall they drank coffee which uh -huh. to me was very exotic <laughs> I mean five, six, seven years old um, uh, but it was some beverage they were drinking that I thought was coffee mm -hmm. so, so I got to see the the um, 
the the mixture at AUB, and then there was an earshot of our house was the Muezzin, and we and we heard we heard the call to prayer yes. uh, live, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, uh, every day. In a sense, there is a an, a memory of a celebration of different communities living together, a diversity yes. in a very closed space but that the way of governing seems to have run its course and that maybe we'll see something else emerge over the coming months, coming years. It's at least worth a try. I think it's worth a try, and I think, of course, it's worth a try. Yeah. And I think it may be easier than people realize. Mm-hmm. One of the, uh, my book about religion, Breaking the Spell, one of the messages at the end about what should be done is mainly relax not all that much that has to be done. This is changing before our eyes. The the very transparency of the modern world, thanks to uh, digital communication, is opening up all the pockets of secrecy. Not all of them, alas, uh, and and with some bad effects. But the hold that religion has on people is diminishing really daily. The yes. fastest growing population in the world is no religion at all. Mm-hmm. It takes about 20 years to uh, birth and, and rear a Baptist <laughs> and 20 minutes to lose one. <laughs> so birth rate doesn't, doesn't come close to keeping up with the cultural evolution that's happening all around us. Right. Well, I, I hope some of these ideas take hold in Lebanon, and I know that you'll be visiting next year. Unfortunately, not at AUB for the spring term, but I know that you still visit and you'll be coming several times next year. Ho- hope to see you in, in your hometown. And uh, I hope. And the next time you're here, I'd like to go to the banyan tree with you. I think that would be a treat for both of us. I would love to do that, Ronnie. Dan, thanks for your time. Thank you, Ronnie. celebrated philosopher who grew up in Beirut during the first years of Lebanon's independence from French rule. 76 years ago today, the Lebanese Republic was born. To everyone who's been listening to these episodes since the uprising began, or for that matter, since this podcast started, happy Independence Day from Lebanon. This year, it's worth celebrating. I'm Rani Shatah, and this is the Beirut Banyan. <laughs>